It's that word we're all sick of hearing, lockdown. You must stay at home. No socialising, no adventures and fishing under multiple restrictions. But rather than moan about it, we're bringing you this series to keep you going through these troublesome times. I'm Alan Blair and these are the Lockdown Lives. When the first lockdown hit, I undertook daily Instagram live streams, but once they were done, 24 hours later, they were gone forever. I was inundated with messages from people who had missed them, they had questions to ask, and they wanted to hear them again. So whether you've got questions about bait, want to hear me rant about what's right or wrong with fishing, FAQs, fishing in the upper layers, and plenty more, I hope this series will help answer some of your questions and potentially give you a little fishing fix during the most frustrating of times. These are the Lockdown Lives. Hi everyone, I'm back. How are we all? Still in lockdown, that's for sure. Um, Have you been fishing? Maybe off the back of last episode when we talked about rigs, you've been out there and you maybe tried a new rig for yourself. If you did, I hope you got some success on it. I'm actually looking forward to a session coming up soon for myself. Yeah, it's, um, it's great that we do still get the opportunity, certainly in the UK, to get out there and do a little bit of fishing. Last episode, uh, episode number four, we talked about rigs, specifically three main rigs that I incorporate into my angling that revolve around how I feed those fish. I thought I'd quickly recap on those. When I'm single hook bait fishing, it's the chod rig. For me, it's that cast anywhere rig, turn up, at a venue blind, find some showing fish and I can get a rig out there that I know that's fishing. We talked about spreading boilies around and in that situation I used the longer hook link with a critically balanced bait, in this instance a Ronnie Claw rig. And we talked about knocking up a lovely mix, getting those fish grubbing around on the bottom, feeding nice and slowly. And in that situation I was using the Twister Slip D, short hook link, heavy bottom bait with a nice big heavy inline lead. So that was the last episode. Today we're talking about rigs again, and that is because it is a big topic. There's a a lot of sort of technicalities within it, so I wanted to not sort of brush over it too much and go into a little bit more detail about some of my thoughts on rigs that will hopefully give you a, a little bit more of an insight into what I do when I go fishing. You'll notice all three of those rigs I just showed, the chod rig, the uh, helicopter setup with a Ronnie Claw rig and also the uh, Twister Slip D with the big heavy inline. They all incorporate the quick cling on leader. I mentioned it last time, I use it for all my leader setups. Um, maybe the only time I wouldn't would be when I'm fishing a gin clear gravel pit and I'll potentially use a fluorocarbon or a diffusion camo leader. But this is quite a new product in terms of, for many, many years, I actually use lead core. So why am I using this cling on leader now as opposed to lead core? The benefits of lead core were that it was very, very heavy. Um, the downside of lead core is, and I'm going to use this as a kind of example, because of that heavy lead inside, you can see it doesn't follow the contours very well. So unless you're fishing on a, a truly flat, perfect bottom, you could end up with situations like this where it's either going across things or potentially sticking up really, really badly. It just doesn't follow the contours very well. Um, the Klingon leader doesn't have any lead inside, but it's still immensely heavy. The, the huge benefit of this is how supple it is. And if I pop this back down again, you know, you can see just how much more it will follow all the contents, contours it goes over. So for me, I've used this now for a number of years. It's available in a 65 and a 45 pound braking strain. It's also available in a ready tied version. Because I think a lot of people, when you mention lead core or Klingon, they immediately sort of shy away from it thinking, no, nah, no, nah, it's too difficult to splice, it's too difficult to splice. So what I wanted to show you now is actually just how easy it is to splice. By splicing your own, it allows you to be a lot more creative with your rigs. You can, you know, create very, very short, for example, leaders for fishing solid bags, having them pre-tied, or potentially very, very long ones, you know, for certain situations. To splice it, take the scissors and cut it off. I'm going to start with a 65 pound and the thing you might notice straight away is I'm not using a splicing needle. You know, we sell a splicing needle, but I find it a lot easier to use just a, a micro captive boilie needle. So that's a boilie needle with a gate on the end to splice safely, easily, simply pop the end of your gated needle inside the sheath of the, the Klingon and then using your finger and thumb, it's really important that you kind of keep your finger and thumb in this position to stop it bursting out of the sheath. Just push the needle up the inside. 
So I'm keeping my finger and thumb there as opposed to just trying to push now, because if I do, it will burst out and just work it up there really easily. And I'm looking to get a minimum of sort of an inch and a half onto the needle itself. I can then burst it back out and I'm going to push the Klingon leader all the way to the bottom of the needle like this. And what that's doing is it's opening those fibres up to make it a lot easier for me to pull the tag end back through. Take the end and don't go right in at the end, you know, a couple of million. Come in about sort of eight to ten millimetres, pop it in, close the gate on your needle, like so, and then work this back up over the end. Dead simple. Pop it out, take a knot pull at all, and give it a pull. The more I pull on this, the stronger it becomes. You know, there's absolutely no way that's going to let you down. If you're left with a little tag end here, I'll just pull a, a little bit more of it out again, cut all that off, and give it a pull. Really, really simple. I could have spliced a swivel in there. Um, I'm just going to do the 40 pound version because that is thinner and, and a tad more difficult, but still, you know, still nice and easy. We talked about this before in fishing. Everything revolves around practice, practice, practice. So taking the sort of narrower version, the 40 pound, pop that gated needle in there again, using my finger and thumb, keep it inside. Work it up the inside of the sheath, making sure I'm not letting it burst back out again. Sliding on there really easy. Pop it out once I've got my inch and a half on there. Work the fibres all the way to the bottom, which help open it out to make it a little bit easier. Go to the tag end. Don't go in too close to the end. Come in about 8 to 10 millimetres. Catch the gate in there. Close the gate up. And then I can work this up here, creating a loop. You're probably thinking, oh, he makes it look so easy, but it actually really is easy. I think for me, one of the big things was not using the delicate splicing needles, actually using a captive, you know, a micro captive boily needle. But you can see there, I've got my loop in the end. I can pull that incredibly hard and it will never let me down. So yeah, across all my rigs, all my leaders, that's what I'm using, the Klingon leader, because of how incredibly supple it is and how it will follow the contours of every lake bed. You may well find that on the venue you're fishing, leaders are banned. It's quite common now. People perceive them as being dangerous and stuff. I don't think they're dangerous at all. You know, it's, it's about the angler fishing safely with them. But as I say, you, you, you will find a number of venues which you know, don't allow leaders. In that instance, you're probably going to have to use tubing. Now, tubing also presents issues in terms of people more often than not find it quite difficult to thread. So I was going to run through quickly with you now just a couple, two or three very simple tips to ensure that you can get this onto your main line nice and easy. If we take a section of this and cut it off. The first and most important thing is this isn't wet, nor is your main line. If you try and pass a main line through here that's wet, the moisture will you know, just make the, the mono stick to the inside of the tubing and it will be incredibly difficult to thread. So I'm making sure everything's dry. Take my mono. This is 12 pounds. So you imagine this is coming off your reel now. And it's also important, now I do this a lot, use my teeth. It's just quicker than using scissors. But if you do, it puts a little flat on the end of the mono. Again, that will make it really difficult to thread. So always use scissors to cut a nice flush end on. And then you can start threading. I see a lot of people like sort of laying this down on a tackle box or their sleep system, for example, and then they're trying to push it through like this. It's important you utilise the gravity and you thread downwards. So let the tubing hang down like this and then start threading from the top, pushing it down like so. And that is through already. I think 
sure some of you watching this are going, tubing's not that easy to thread, it's not that easy to thread. But if you follow those sort of three simple guidelines, make sure it's dry, make sure you cut the end of your mono and don't bite it like I do all the time, and make sure you use gravity and thread downwards, you can see just how easy you can get a bit of tubing on there. You know, we supply it in one metre lengths, easily be able to thread a whole metre up, for example. I'll just take another one. This Klingon tubing is really heavy. It's heavily uh, impregnated with the tungsten. Um, if we drop a little bit in a tank, you can see just how heavy it is. Straight down to the bottom, bang. You probably wouldn't get the same with some of the other tubings that are not impregnated with the tungsten. This is our diffusion camo one. If I drop a bit of that in, although color matching on various different lake bed bottoms, it will be better. You can see there's air trapped in there already. So Klingon tube, again, Boom, straight down to the bottom. It's nowhere near as supple as the Klingon leader, but if you are fishing a venue where leaders are banned, then for me, that is the next best thing, some, some Klingon tube. Just gonna show you a 20 pound mono, which is obviously a lot thicker than the 12 pound. Again, take a length for the tube. Making sure everything's dry making sure the end of my mono coming off my reel is cut and not bitten and then using gravity pop that in the end and just thread it all down Couldn't be simpler. There you can see it in the tank. Really, really heavy, will sit on the bottom. So hopefully that will make threading tubing a little bit easier for you. What about if you're fishing maybe more extreme? Um, there's lots of snags, there's lots of weed. Um, there is lots of structure down there. There are times when you might have to incorporate, for example, a snag leader into your fishing. Um, these are heavy duty mono snag leaders, um, available in three different diameters, all the way up to sort of 60 pounds. For me, joining this to my main line, I use uh, very simply a back to back grin or not, and I'm going to show you that now. So, again, imagine this is coming off my main line. That's my main line. I can then take some of the snag leader, and to join these two together, I lay them alongside each other, like so, making sure I've got a decent bit of excess. And then I can form a loop in one bit and go through the loop one, two, three, four times. Pull it down, like we discussed in the last episode, all knots, a little bit of saliva on there. And then I take the mono snag end yeah, mono main line, do exactly the same thing, form a loop, go through one, two, three, four, but this time I'm going to go five times. And with the lighter diameter, oh, it's so tricky whenever I'm not using my mouth. take it for granted, you know, I do anyway, how much I use my teeth and my mouth for tying things. So four, and one more time, a fifth time. Again, wet it all. And then, leaving the tag ends, just slowly pull down on either end till they kind of meet in the middle. Then I will take the tag ends, this is where I've got to use my teeth. Pull it. Pull it, bed it down a bit more, again the tag ends, pull, pull, pull it down a bit more. Last time on the tag ends, give it a really good pull. Remember this is for fishing in extreme situations, snag, weed, structures. Cut it off, not too tight, leaving about two mil tag end. And the same on the main line side, cut it off. And you've got a really neat knot there, so that's a back-to-back -back grinner. And that knot is exactly the same as if um, I was using uh, a spod, for example. Um, if I take some spod braid here, I'm 
Now, spod braid is really low in diameter, and that's because you know we want it to travel out there a long way potentially. So it's really, really thin. I wouldn't be able to spod straight off the reel without I'd get a lot of crack offs. So I'm going to use a higher diameter sort of shock leader braid there um, to actually attach my spod to. So the knot is exactly the same. Lay the two alongside each other. Take the thick braided shock leader and go one. Oh, I want to use my mouth. Two, three, and four. Pull that down. Not too tight, but just so it's sort of bedded down a little bit. And then taking the lighter spot of marker braid, I'm going to go one, two, Three, four, I hope this don't look dreadful guys, five. So remember always with a lighter diameter I go an extra turn, again pull that down just a little bit, wet it all and then slowly bring them together, pull them a little bit tight, pull on the tag ends, one, two, give it a further pull and then I can cut those off. Again, leaving around sort of two millimetres. Like so. So I've joined a nice heavy sort of casting shock leader there to that light braid. On the reel itself, I won't be able to set this up and show you properly in here, but I've basically just got a few turns of that on the reel. Um, that means whenever this is extended fully, my spot's around here for the cast and stuff. I've still got a couple of turns of that on the reel to enable me to really put a, a bit of force into the cast. And the last thing I should mention, going back to the snag fishing, this is something I've been doing for the last few years now, again in those really gin clear gravel pit kind of scenarios, and that's instead of using just a straight mono snag leader, I've been using the 060, the 35 pound fluoro link, purely because of its uh, invisible properties, you know, whenever the water's really, really clear, that there can also act as a very, very good snag leader. So that's the back-to-back -back grinner knot. You know, you could also use it for a combi knot, for example, if you wanted to, um, fish a very stiff section in your hook link and then a very supple section up by the hook itself That's where I would use the same knot, you know, for, jo for joining two materials together What's next? Fishing in weed. It's something that intimidates people. People are scared of it. They're worried by it I'll often hear anglers say I've turned up at a venue. I've looked. It's just weed everywhere. I don't know what to do um, it can present problems, but what we need to understand as anglers that in this stuff here, in all this weed, there's lots of cover, there's lots of food, um, and the fish love to spend great amounts of time in it. Um, so it would be silly for us as anglers not to, to fish near it if that's where the fish want to be. Um, for me, it falls into sort of two categories. Um, I'm no expert, you know, in, in aquatic plant life, but keeping it really simple, guys, you can have low-lying weed, you know, weed that's very, very close to the bottom, something like blanket weed here, which basically creates a carpet over everything. If you've ever kept a, a pond at home, you'll see this growing up the sides of it and stuff, and lots of lakes have it in there. Some people call it candy floss weed, I call it blanket weed. And then you've got other weed that, you know, will grow from the bottom in the silt and stuff, but it will grow upwards. Um, they're the two kind of types. Both of them require sort of sunlight photosynthesis in order to grow. Um, this particular weed here, it, it presents issues, but if I go through some of it now, let me see if I can find anything. Look, there's a little freshwater shrimp. Um, it'll be absolutely crawling with food. Load more shrimp there. Uh, some little bugs. Uh, there's some snails there. You know, and bearing in mind we're in a real cold part of the year, some kind of larvae there. Um, it's still retaining lots of natural food and stuff, so the fish will always go there and, and look to harvest that. Um, lots of little bugs there and stuff. So yeah, it's crawling with natural food. For me, fishing over this kind of candy floss blanket weed, um, it's, no, 
It, there's no point fishing a bottom bait in it. Even a solid bag, it can get masked and stuff. Um, for me, the number one choice is, is a chod rig. A nice sort of high choddy that will sit and fish directly over the top of that weed. That will always be my, my number one tactic, you know, in that situation, little water potman there. Um, that will be my number one tactic over the top of that, to fish a choddy. Um, the other type, you know, this weed that's growing up in big strands, you need to kind of think that, yeah, go back to the photosynthesis thing, but going back to the sunlight thing, yes, you can turn up at a venue and you can look at it and it just looks like it's covered in weed. Um, it's very similar to a forest, a rainforest, for example. If you fly over that in a helicopter and you look down on that canopy, it will just be lush and green. But underneath all that, where everything's living, it's just the trunks. You know, there's very little green down there because there's no sunlight getting down to it uh, in order for those uh, plants and trees to photosynthesize. So all the growth is basically put into the top of the trees. And it's the same when we go carp fishing. We'll look at a venue, we'll go, whoa, that's mega weedy. But underneath that, it's quite dark, you know, and it's just sort of single strands going up. In that situation, a very good tactic, you know, that I've used over the years is to take um, a heavy lead, four, maybe six ounces, and put that into a solid bag and then fill it with bait, which turns this into, I don't know, 12, 14 ounces of weight. Yes, I'm not going to be able to cast this very far, but what this allows me to do is to almost puncture that top canopy and to then fall down through, um, down to the bottom where it will dissolve. You know, I can have a nice green cling on leader there, for example, that will just look exactly like a, 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 a piece of weed stem. This will dissolve down on the bottom. The carp are all in there underneath, you know, searching and looking for food anyway. Everything's protected in the solid bag, so there's no risk of my hook point catching anything on the way down. And yeah, just by making sure that's nice and heavy, possibly with a downwards cast even, you know, to puncture that top canopy, you can fish effectively down underneath that, that sort of rainforest roof canopy. It's where the fish are, it's where they feel safe. If you're thinking, yeah, but isn't it dangerous fishing in weed? You know, how am I gonna land them and stuff? It's, it's <laughs> to be honest with you, I love fishing in weed because it makes landing them so much easier. Once they've got a bit of weed covered over their eyes and stuff, they tend to stop fighting and they just come in very, very slowly. In a situation where a fish has weeded you up, you know, some people will say, you know, set the rod down, let it swim back outwards again. It can work, you know, and there's been the odd time over the years when I have done that. But more often than not, I've found it to be a lot more beneficial to stay in direct contact with the fish. That doesn't mean pulling like this, you know. It means just putting a little bit of pressure on the rod and just sort of standing there. And occasionally you'll feel a little kick, yeah. It's at that point when the fish kicks, that's when I'd also pull back a little bit more. And what I'm trying to do is break these stems, you know, the, the leader or the main line that's sort of caught in them, break those stems. And I want the fish to kick at the point that I'm pulling back that little bit harder and hopefully break some of that weed away. What will eventually happen is you will get that fish moving. And rather than sort of jerky motions of standing on the spot, trying to reel it in, if I've got the space behind me, I'll just walk back really, really consistently and just keep it moving nice and slowly. Like I say, a weed battle is great because there isn't much of a battle there. Um, and you can hopefully just get the net out and get the big bundle of weed in it and sort the fish out accordingly. So it's important to understand there's lots of food in there, there's lots of cover, and there are ways around fishing in, in that. You know, if it's over the blanket weed, chuck a choddy out over the top of it. If it's in the weed that's growing up in big strands towards the surface, like Canadian pond weed, for example, see if you can puncture it and get a solid bag down through it to where those carp are absolutely happy spending their time. Another option in that weed sort of situation would be, not with a blanket weed, but with the other weed is, you could potentially try clearing a spot, utilising some kind of rake, or if you can get in there in the waders safely, a big rake on a pole, for example, and clear off that area yourself. If you've got a big expanse of weed and you create a nice clear spot in it, you can get a little bit of food down there, especially, you know, something like this, a nice grubbing around mix, which will get the fish in there, tearing the bottom up and ripping up the, the remaining root stems and stuff. You can create a lovely clear area to present a hook bait in amongst. What comes after weed? Bags, you know, we've just touched on it, these great big bags here. Solid bags are something that I do incorporate into my fishing. Um, you will have heard me in the previous episode mention how I also always like to protect the hook point with a little stick. Well, there's no greater way of protecting that hook point by putting it all in a solid bag. 
And I've got a few examples here to show you. Um, this is a Scopex grid one. I've got a cultured hook bait in there. This is the grabbing around mix from the previous episode. That's in the top part of the bag. But in this bottom part of the bag where my hook point is and my hook is, I've got the ultra fine stick mix. So there's nothing there to potentially burr a point over or mask a point. There's no flake down in the bottom of the bag. It's just really fine dusty particles. And the top part is all the food. Um, everything's protected inside there. They're good for sort of long range, medium to long range casting. They're good for being prepared. You know, I could have a few of these wrapped up good to go. I've got a loop here at the end and I can just loop my main line back on or join it back on with a, a, a blood knot or a grinner knot. So there's one option. Another one would be something I'm using more at this time of the year would be a white one on those real dark and dreary lake beds, all that autumn leaf litter and stuff, you know, a white bag is, is incredibly effective, not just on park lakes, anywhere where that lake bottom is silty and dull and gloomy and stuff. Here I've got some white citrus I've just crumbed up, I've got some spod cloud and I've got some liquidized bread and that's again all packed neatly inside a bag. And I'm going to knock up one to show you now exactly how I do it, which is a, a pink citrus one. So to prepare the bag, let's talk about the rig first. I've got an inline lead set up here. We discussed this yesterday. It's not a drop-off version, but it could be if I incorporated the double ring swivel and just passed the leader around the outside. But this is just a standard one. I've got a two ounce lead. You can go heavier, but you've got to take into account the weight of the food as well, how far you need to cast and stuff. I've got my short twister slip D hook bait arrangement with a citrus cultured hook bait on there. And I'm just going to join that on loop to loop style, which again I showed you yesterday. This is my way of quick changing and doing things nice and simply without too much uh, external components that I really don't feel are required. So slip that on there, like so, there's my setup. I now take the bag. Take a solid PVA bag, and as I mentioned a second ago, the most important thing is that in the bottom where I'm going to place my hook point, I'm using a real fine mix. So this is a citrus fizzing stick mix. Get about an inch of that down in the bottom of the bag, give it a little shake. I can then take my hook bait, get that cultured hook bait in there, and push it all the way down into one of the corners. Ollie really hates me tying these. He says, I'm dreadful at it. Like, they're not very neat, Alan. You take too long doing them. I'm not an expert, far from it. But it is a great tactic, you know, that works. So I've got loads of citrus fizzing stick mix down there protecting the hook point. You know, the choice of what you put in now is really entirely up to you. I love the flakes. So I'm going to put some citrus flake in there, a little bit of two mil pellet, a little bit more flake, pop a couple of whole boilies in, just because that's what the hook bait is. Push all that down. Pop my lead inside next. Like so. And I can then top that up with a little bit more flake. And the top of the bag where I'm going to tie it off, I'm going to use a little bit more of the fizzing stick mix. Like so, give it a good shake. The bags are nice and strong. So I'm just shaking it to start with. Give it a last push down, then be a bit more brutal with it, tapping it all down. That's forcing everything down the bag. And then give it one twist at the top, like so. Pinch it, take some tape, bit of PVA tape, and then gonna wrap that around just a couple of times tie the bag off with just a couple of overhand knots. One, and then a double this time. One, two, like so. Whoa, we're getting in a mess. Now cut the excess PVA tags off, cut the excess bag off. Just be careful you don't actually cut your leader. like so. And then just sorting out the bottom of the bag, I'm going to tuck the corners in just by pushing them in like this, folding this over, licking it. Same on the other side. 
roll that over. And there you have it. A finished PVA bag. Really good tactic for ensuring that not only have you got a great parcel of food around your hook bait, but you've protected everything. You know, you can cast that out there. It's going to go down onto the lake bed bottom, dissolve nicely, and you're fishing. It goes back to what I was saying to you about the trolley and why I love that so much. I know when that goes out in the water, I'm fishing. We'll drop that in now. We'll have a little tidy up. You can see everything's breaking down nicely. The fizzing stick mix will start to work and stuff. I suppose if I was going to sum it up in one sentence, that is confidence in a bag. Moving on to some other sort of rigs that I do incorporate into my fishing quite a lot. You've got here um, a sweet corn rig. Sweet corn, we discussed it in the bait episode, is a phenomenal bait. Um, if it's tricky, you know, if they've been caught a lot on boilies and pop-ups and stuff, if they've been hammered, for example, maybe over a spring and a summer, so this is going into the autumn period, if I'm on somewhere that's highly pressured and stuff, I've found that a single bit of plastic really can catch a lot of fish. Going into the very cold winter months as well, sort of liquidising up some sweet corn, again, it's a very good tactic. It's a real simple arrangement. Um, I've kind of taken a size six uh, twister, created a little hair, popped my single grain of corn on there, and then I've whipped it very, very tightly to the shank, um, like a reverse KD. So I've gone up all the way until I'm in line with the point, pulled that hair back, done three turns this side, and then gone all up over it, and then back down through the eye. Got my little kicker on there just to help turn it, but that's another rig that, you know, it'll sit on the bottom like so, and it's caught me an awful lot of fish. Um, the same as maggots. Um, I'll show you a couple of different maggot presentations here now. Um, I love maggots, and in, a, in an up-and-coming episode, we'll talk about how I incorporate them into my stalking, but this is for sort of bottom bait fishing. Here is my winter version. It's again a size 6 twister, um, 25 pound armour link, and a little rubber maggot on the end to, to act as the aligner, and I literally just hook on couple of maggots. Wow, my maggot supply. This is it. This is all I've got left, guys. Tackle shops are not open. I'm literally running my uh, reserve down to the minimum. So yeah, pop on some of these very old maggots, like so. Two or three. Like that. And that is my sort of winter maggot rig. That's when they're not feeding with gusto. You know, they're just eating a little bit. I might fish some dead maggots and some live maggots around it. Um, I get away with it in the winter because a lot of the smaller fish, I think I touched on this before, they've pushed into the rushes to hide away from the cormorants and stuff. But yeah, that would be my sort of winter maggot approach. When the fish are feeding a lot more aggressively, they're a lot more hungry, you can get away with using a lot more maggots, for example, but only really on venues where you haven't got lots of nuisance fish present, I would use something like this. So again, short section of 25 pound arm link, size six twister, got my little kicker on there. But this time on the hair, I've actually added a ball of foam. And in the top of that, I've got a maggot clip here. And it will allow me to open the maggot clip up, take some maggots, whack them on there. It's basically just a bigger maggot rig. I'll probably put maybe a dozen to 15 maggots on there. This will be fished definitely on a clear bottom, sand, gravel, clay, um, somewhere where the, the maggots can't crawl down into deep silt, for example. And I really get this rig working for me because it's kind of critically balanced. You've got the maggots wriggling everywhere. You've taken the weight out of them by putting that foam underneath. If I just quickly whack some of these on here, I'll show you. They really are a great bait, but not if you've got a lake full of bream or tench or, or roach and stuff. If you're lucky enough to fish a venue with um, really just carp present, for example, they can be deadly, absolutely deadly, especially if they've not been hammered on them. But then that applies to everything, really. You know, if you're the first on the water um, and you're using something that the carp haven't been caught on a lot, more often than not, it will be a massive, massive edge. So I'll just close that clip back up pull the foam up into it, 
if I get a little needle, no. It will be something like that. And the maggots wriggling around will actually allow that rig to dance around on the spot. Again, we talked about in a previous episode, carp are not sort of predators in, in the same sense as pike or, or perch or zander or catfish. But believe you me, that wriggling around on a nice clear spot somewhere with a few other maggots in the vicinity can really catch you an awful lot of fish. What we got next? Better tidy them away. Um, river fishing. You know, if you followed me on Instagram and stuff over, over the years and some of the films, I love river carp fishing. The banks are quieter. To a degree, you're fishing for the unknown a little bit more. And one of the most common questions I get is, why such a long rig? Why are you using such a long rig? Now, what I'm about to show you doesn't apply for, for all the river fishing I do because there's stretches of river I have fished um, where you can pretty much use um, your normal carp fishing setups. I use little twister slip Ds. Even in some instances, you can get away with a pop-up when there's not too much flow. But when you're fishing somewhere with a lot more flow, um, especially in sort of the autumn and the winter months, you're going to get a lot of debris coming down the river, a lot of leaf uh, debris, a lot of twigs, a lot of branches, a lot of weed that's been ripped up out of the bottom and stuff. And in that situation, I do fish with a very long rig. Um, and I'm going to show you the rig now and why I do it. This is the setup. So I've got 35 pound fluoro link there. We showed you uh, earlier how I joined that to my main line. That goes down to a, a lead clip. I've got a big tractor lead there that's going to grip down into the bottom and hold in the flow. And then I've got my hook link, which is, yeah, really, really quite long. It is a twister slip D. I've changed the small screw for a big screw because I need it to be heavy. I don't want my hook bait wafting around in the river. I'd never use a snowman, for example, or a critically balanced bait in this situation. I can then take a cultured hook bait, whack that on the screw. These are already heavy, it's a 24 mil. Not that you have to fish 24, but again, some of the rivers I've fished have been full of bream and stuff, and it just sort of gives you a little bit longer to hopefully uh, allow a carp to pick up your hook bait. So I've whacked that onto the screw, like so. I then, again going back to the importance of making sure my hook point's always protected, um, especially a lot of the, the fishing in the river will be done over sort of hopefully a nice clean gravel uh, run. Pop my stick on to the little gated needle. I can run that all the way down the hook link. Like so. Pop the point of the hook into the mesh itself because it's just that fine stick mix dust. There's no danger of uh, damaging my point there. So I've protected that. And then just up from that, I'm going to add a split shot. Like so. Something like that. And that's to hope just help that hook point to drop in or, or prick a little bit. Bearing in mind my lead's so far away now, when the fish do pick it up, just to drop that hook point down and, and prick in the bottom of the fish's mouth. And then I can join that to the lead clip. Again, I've got my big loop here for the quick change. Pop that on, open the loop out, pop everything through. So dead simple loop to loop, like so. And there's the finish set up. What I'll do before casting out, you know, I will feed, you know, throw boilies in or use a big spoon and throw boilies in, but I will more often than not fish a little stringer just to ensure there's some free offerings directly around where my hook bait is. So I can take some PVA tape, take a stringer needle. I've taken the boilies, I've just taken the edges off them so they're not truly round. I don't really want them rolling downstream away from the hook bait, so just by flattening them off a little bit, it makes them sit that little bit better on the, the riverbed. I can whack a few of them on there. Like so. Take the tape. Slide them all down the tape. Make sure there's a little bit of separation between them, like that. And then on the clip itself, where I've got the ring, I can thread the tape through there, tie a couple of overhand knots. Like 
so. And that's just absolutely ensuring that around the, the hook bait itself, I've got a few free offerings. So going back to why so long, let's imagine now this is dissolved. Difficult to show you here, but they've sort of spread themselves out along. Got a lead here, my rig sitting there. I'm now going to fish with my tips up nice and high because I don't want loads of line cutting through the river. It's going to give me more um, points where things can build up on the line. So I want the least amount of line entering the water. My rod's going to be positioned really high and this is coming directly up like this. If I fished with a normal short hook link, let's say for example nine inches long, like that. Couple of things. Firstly, my line's coming up directly like this. The fish might feel it and touch it and spook. Don't want that. So I'm creating that separation by fishing a nice long hook link. But more importantly, as stuff comes down the river in this direction, it's going to build up around here. Yeah. If my hook bait is just here, potentially things are going to cover it over. I've even had things like sanitary towels build up on the line. You know, you really don't know what's coming down the river, but it will build up around this point here. So just by keeping that hook bait nice and far away, hopefully it's always accessible to those carp. So that hopefully answers the question, why such a long rig when river fishing? Um, kind of brings me to a close. I was just going to, before I finish, run through my work box. Um, it's kind of the final thing for me with regards to terminal tackle. There is a lot to take into consideration, the substrate you're fishing over, how are you feeding them, and it does require a large number of items, some small bits and stuff. And for me, I think it's really important that you're organised. There's a number of different ways you can do that, um, but I like to use the work box, so this is it here. Um, it's got sort of two main compartments and then this internal divider. In one side you can fit a tackle box, so this is a medium capacity tackle box. And then inside here there's lots of little boxes. I've got all my hook links and my leaders in here. I've got my chod box. I've got various boxes, that's a slim box three. Slim box eight, with all my swivels, clips. I've got my slim box free again with lead clips and tail rubbers and stuff. I've got a deep box one with foam and critically balancing tools. Slim box, uh, deep box six with again loads of beads in. Here I've got all my hooks nicely organised. This side I've got all my tools, my Leatherman, glue if I need it. And then in this compartment here, I've got a few more boxes, plastic. Crayfish, really, that's what I've got that for. Um, some zig bugs, but we'll cover zigs properly in another episode. A little bit of snag leader, some mono, in case I do need to do a bit of float fishing or, or zig fishing. And then this little thing here, which is new, it's not even got a name yet, but I keep all my PVA in there. Um, some other little bits, and I've got some pre-tied leaders in these little wallets here. And it just keeps me really, really organised. Some of you might think, whoa, that's so much gear, but everything there will cover me in every situation. Doesn't matter where in, in Europe I'm traveling or fishing, whatever sort of environment I'm sort of up against, however the carp want to feed and stuff, I've got everything stored there nice and organized. That pretty much covers rigs now, guys. I hope it's been insightful and useful. Next episode, we're gonna come away from terminal tactical specific and try and cover some frequently asked questions um, but we'll talk about that more in the next episode until then have a lovely day a lovely week and most of all i do hope you get out there and try and put a little bit of this into practice and catch some lovely fish big ups guys catch you later